Hello, my name is Saduki, and I'm going to take you on a journey on how you can bring up our future. What does it take to mentor our junior developers? I dedicate this talk to the 42nd Saduki Squadron. They were a group of folks who wanted to become developers, and I had the privilege to teach them Java back in September of 2016. So this is for you folks as well, who are no longer juniors, but who are now bringing up juniors of your own. So what is a mentor? Well, a mentor is somebody who is experienced and trusted. They're folks who can offer guidance and advice in achieving a goal in life. So if you're thinking to yourself, well, I am here today, but where will I be in five years from now? Well, maybe five years from now, you don't want to be a, just a junior dev at that point, but maybe you want to focus on something like building an API. Or maybe you want to do something such as data engineering and, na and natural language processing. That's my current goal. Uh, but you have this goal that you want to achieve and you want to find somebody who can offer that guidance, maybe shepherd you along the way. A mentor will be there to help you with that. A mentor is somebody who's going to see your talents and abilities much better than you can see them in yourself. And a mentor will help bring those talents and abilities out of you. They'll not take them away, but to bring light to them, to encourage you to continue to use them and grow them. To give you some background about my experience with junior devs, in addition to the 42nd Suduki Squadron, earlier in my career, I mentored 10 to 15 junior developers. So I was already in my career for maybe about a year or two when the new developers started to fall under my wings. In August of 2014, I joined the Software Guild and I was there till December 2017. And while I was there, I mentored over 200 junior developers from both an in-person and an online program. And my apprentices there were all walks of life. If you dealt with me in the classroom, you knew I would talk about my kids. My kids were sometimes younger than me, sometimes older than me, sometimes my parents' age. But they were still considered my kids. They were my apprentices. They were my students. And they came from all different walks of life. We had some who were right out of high school. Really sharp, really running on a lot of energy. It was amazing to see with such little bias what they could create. We had older folks coming in th too, so let's go with the middle-aged folks who are maybe pursuing a second or third career. And then we had even older folks who are at the point of retirement who they don't want to waste their retirement just sitting around doing nothing. They want to keep the brain sharp. So they wanted to learn newer things. Some people came in with no prior technical experience. We had folks who were stay-at-home parents who wanted to get back in the field. We've had folks who were chefs. We've had folks who were engineers, like mechanical engineers. We've had musicians, all sorts of walks of life, not necessarily technical. We also had some senior developers who had older technologies under their belt, but it didn't have newer technologies. Once I left the guild, I couldn't walk away from mentoring. I've always enjoyed bringing folks in the field, and so nowadays I mentor in the tech community. Now, when I was at the Guild, I had to take a course that involved reading a bunch of books, listening to a bunch of podcasts, and then talking with my, my course mates on the various different lessons that we've learned from our assignments. And reading The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho is one of those assignments. And this quote from the book really just stood out. This, when you really want something, all the universe conspires in helping you achieve it. And this is one of those lines that I use with mentoring folks nowadays, after I've already read the book. And this is a book I continue to recommend because of this theme. So this is a theme that runs throughout this parable. When I first read it, I didn't want to believe it. I, I, I knew the book was talking to me, but I didn't want to hear it. 
I love teaching. I love bringing folks in the field. It was a dream for me. But I was missing something, and I wasn't sure what that was. But the universe knew that I was missing something. It knew I was missing development. At my core, I am a developer. I've been doing this development for over 20 years. Whether it was professionally or as a hobby, I've always enjoyed development. I've always enjoyed writing code. And apparently the universe picked up on that. So I ended up getting back into development, doing web development with C-sharp and HTML and CSS and JavaScript. About one and a half years though, after going back into development, an opportunity appeared to be able to do both web development and curriculum development. So here we are two years later since I've given this talk. This quote is back again. This opportunity showed up. And now here I am. So this is a theme that keeps coming up and this is a book that I will continue to recommend because if you really want it to happen, the world may make it happen. Now I have to tell people too to encourage to have multiple mentors. I've met people who love mentoring so much but they're like, mine. They're territorial. This person is my mentee. Don't be like that with each other. Encourage multiple members mentors because multiple mentors is men multiple mindsets, multiple backgrounds, multiple perspectives, multiple stories. And I actually have a personal experience with this. So in 2011, I was at a point where I was doing development, but I was not happy with where I was, not happy with where I was in my career. And I ended up quitting my software development role to start my own company. It was one of those that my mentor in the tech field, he was outside of the company I worked for, but was somebody I trusted in the tech community. He saw that potential in me. He encouraged me to, to grow in my tech career. He reminded me of the things that I really enjoyed doing. At that same time, I happened to meet somebody with a very strong business background. And forming my own LLC, he asked the tough questions. He asked, what's the direction you want to go and why? Where do you see yourself in the future? Having the different mindsets, having those different perspectives really forced me to think of where was I going. So my own mentors challenging me and seeing that I had that potential to succeed. Now, these are just some of the stories that you've heard about me personally. Let's talk about what I do in the field and how it has worked for working with junior developers. Check your egos at the door. Mentoring isn't about you or you or you. It's not about anybody personally. It's about growing each other, but it doesn't have to be about you personally as a, as a person. With a mentoring relationship, you want to set clear expectations. What are you going to get out of that relationship? What is the availability of the person that you're trying to work with? What do you want to focus on? Is there a particular topic, multiple topics? Is there a particular topic that you don't want to talk about? Setting those expectations works for getting the best out of your time together. Now recently I had somebody in the community reach out to me to say, hey, I want to set up a meeting. If there's anything you should know about me, I am quick to be skeptical of meetings. Because meetings for the sake of meetings, mm -mm, my time is valuable. I don't like meetings for the sake of meetings. However, if I have a clear purpose, clear expectation, then we can make it the best for everybody involved. So I asked, what were you expecting to get out of this meeting? Well, he wanted to follow up to see where I'm at and catch up on where things are and how we can help each other. Okay, that helps. But if you don't set those expectations clearly, it's quite possible that things aren't going to be understood, things are going to get murky, things may try to cross into that off-limits discussion area. 
You don't want that. Set clear expectations. And while we're on the topic of clarity, we want to set smarter goals. So this goes back to that course where I had to read books and listen to podcasts. One of the books talked about smarter goals. Setting a goal of, I want to learn React. That's too generic of a goal. How do I know that I've learned React? How do I know that I've learned React to the point where I am happy? How do I know that I've really achieved that goal? So mentors, when you're working with those you are mentoring, encourage them to set smarter goals. Smarter stands for specific. What specifically are you trying to accomplish? Measurable. Measurable in terms of, do you want to do this in a set period of time? Do you want to maybe do X amount of katas to get your, your feet wet in a language, for example? Actionable. What are you going to do for this goal? What are the actions you're going to take to achieve this goal? Realistic. You're not going to learn everything there is to know about JavaScript. I'm not even going to set a time period on that because it's JavaScript. It's still constantly changing. I was writing JavaScript in the late 90s, and nowadays I'm working with React, and my 90s JavaScript versus React, that's changed quite a bit. And the frameworks in between from like jQuery to working with things like Handlebars and Mustache to Vue and Angular, you know, the pre-Angular days before TypeScript showed up. JavaScript is just this massive thing. So to understand all of JavaScript, not realistic. But maybe to understand how JavaScript handles Ajax, that could be realistic. Timely, set a time frame, box it, commit to this goal. If it's that important, you will commit to it. Make exciting goals. If they're exciting, you really want to achieve it. You really want to make that happen. And make sure the goals are relevant to whatever you're trying to do and not something totally absurd and out in left field. Now, Mr. Rogers, he was an integral part of my childhood. We learned a lot of episodes from his... We learned a lot from his episodes. What I like most about Mr. Rogers is that he made it so that even the toughest of things for adults to talk about, he made it so that it was approachable for kids. And so to this day, even as a parent, I have a special place in my heart for Mr. Rogers and uh, Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood, which is what the kids are watching nowadays, it carries on his legacy. But one of the things that he has said is one of the greatest gifts you can give anybody is the gift of your honest self. The gift of your honest self. Don't try to manage multiple personas. And this is my mentoring persona versus my professional speaking persona versus my mom persona. Don't try to separate multiple personas and don't try to portray yourself as something you're not. Be your honest self. It's so much easier that way. It's something that if you see me on Twitter, you see me on LinkedIn, you see me here giving presentations, I me all the time. Because being me, everybody knows then who I am and what I'm about. Now dealing with juniors is a bit tricky. And this is going to be a little bit controversial for some folks, but go in the relationship with trust and respect already there. I know a lot of people are saying trust and respect should be earned, but I say trust and respect until burned. And here, there's a reason why for that. If you go in with trust and respect and they see that, that will help them to trust and respect you. Their trust and respect for you has to be earned because you're a stranger. Yes, they're strangers to you as well, but you're the mentor. You're the one with the experience and they have to trust you even more that you're going to lead them in a good direction. And I say trust and respect until burn because that burn may happen. I did have an apprentice who had a tough lesson learned in the classroom. 
where something happened the night before, it was a rough morning, and I still made him do his presentation. And it was a lesson that was tough, but it was still a lesson. Separate your opinions from facts. I can't stress this hard enough as a mentor. Especially in development. We're developers. We have opinions. Oh, do we have opinions on everything. But when you're in a mentoring relationship, that opinion isn't necessarily important. It's usually more of what are the facts. My example on this is with ORMs. ORMs, micro ORMs, and anti ORM. So ORMs are object relational mappers, like Entity Framework. Uh, micro ORMs are like Dapper, for example. And then just doing vanilla database calls with ADO.NET. So I'm using C sharp examples here. But it's one of those that people have opinions on them. I have strong opinions on them, but they don't come out in my classroom. I'm going to teach them about what are object relational mappers, what are the micro object relational ma mappers, what's life without an object relational mapper, and show the pros and cons of both without my personal opinion coming in there. Because I don't want to push my bias on them. I want them to make those judgments for themselves. As mentors, it's not up to us to have our biases. It's up to us to inform them of what is all out there and available. And encourage your curiosity. Like I said with juniors, they come in no bias. They come in with a different perspective altogether. So let me tell you a story about this encouraging their curiosity. We're gonna go back to, it was 1998. And I was in an internship role doing QA. So I had data sheets and I had to make sure that they were getting into the database just fine. So pulling them up, checking the numbers. I love data. If there's anything you need to know about me, I love data. Always have. And I got assigned to work with a, a contractor at this place. And we had a project where we had to move from an access database to a SQL Server database with a Visual Basic front end. This was something I was like, oh, okay, I get to do some programming, possibly. This could be interesting. And I get to move data around, and I get to learn whatever the SQL Server stuff is. This sounds pretty cool. That contractor saw my energy, saw how excited I got about databases. That he said, you like this, and you're good at this, and you show potential. I got to introduce you to somebody else. And so he took me upstairs, and I got to meet the Oracle DBA. And I was just like, what is Oracle? Whole different world. More data. More data managed in a different way. Though it's SQL statements are like, what? This isn't my normal SQL that I was used to learning SQL Server for this. But it was still so cool to see the different tools out there and data, data everywhere. Now I told you, that was back in 1998. Here we are today in 2020. A few years ago, I actually was working at the Software Guild still. And I remember that our operations manager said, Hey Sarah, there was a guy looking for you. Now being in tech, guy's looking for me to ask me questions. It's the norm. But I was very concerned because the way she said it, I knew it wasn't like the intern or the apprentices or anybody else in the office. So I was a little confused. But I remember seeing a guy a few weeks earlier with a British accent in the elevator. And I'm like, he looks very familiar. Like a ghost in my past from 1998. I'm like, nah, I doubt it's him. But when the operations manager said, there's this guy and he's looking for you. And I asked her, I'm like, does he have a fabulous British accent? And she's like, yes. And I'm like, going pale white here. Because I like that ghost that I saw might not have been a ghost. I'm like, is his name Rich? And she's like, yes. And I'm like, oh no. Where is he? 
And she, here it turned out he worked around the corner from us on our floor for another company in charge of their software engineering team. I was so excited about the opportunity to see him again because he was a contractor I worked with back in 1998. He saw my potential that early in my career. He saw my love of data and he brought that out of me. So I had the opportunity to thank him for that because here we are decades later in my career and I am still telling the story of him taking me under his wing and him taking me upstairs to meet the Oracle DBA. That made a lasting impression. As mentors, you want to encourage a junior's excitement about that. You want to put yourself in your apprentice's shoes. Think about when you were at your point in the career. What would you want them to help you with? Remember that they don't have your years of experience. They don't have your stories. Learn their strengths and weaknesses because there will be a time where you will want to play to strengths and there will be a time where you will see the weaknesses and you will want to fill that gap and help them get better with it. One of my favorite things I love to do, I love food. So coming between me and food is a dangerous thing. Uh, but my mentoring folks, I like to mentor and have conversations over lunch because I love that, that feeling of nourishing our souls, nourishing our bodies, and having those meaningful conversations. This particular screenshot, by the way, was conference food from many, many years ago. And I remember the meal a little bit, but I remember talking with folks in the community about what was going on a lot. When you're mentoring junior developers, encourage questions and let them know that no question is stupid and that a question needs to be asked in order for you to answer it. We're not psychics. AI's, oh, excuse me, AI is out there, but it only gets so far. So ask questions. Questions are okay. Questions again show that curiosity. Questions show what you want to learn. As mentors, we need to demystify questions. For example, authorization versus authentication. Both really long A words, both used around the same time. Juniors are like, eh, aren't they the same thing? They aren't. Actually, I've seen mid developers and senior developers who don't get it. Now, the senior developers are typically those who don't deal with authorization and authentication much, but they're senior because of their years of experience working with whatever technologies they normally work with. Yes, they're big words, but they are different things. Maybe they're looking to get into security and they see red team and blue team. They hear the terms black hat and white hat. What are those? What do they mean? If you're in the security space and you have a a junior who wants to learn more about these terms, explain those to them. Sometimes we have to help our juniors with going through things like the interview process. And why do people really ask that question of how many piano tuners are in an area? I don't like these kind of questions, but I understand why they do them. This is showing, okay, this is an I don't know, but how do you solve I don't know situations? And the question of where do you see yourself in five years? Why do we ask that question? We want to get to goals, perhaps? Maybe you don't have a five year vision. Here we are in 2020 dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. We're lucky sometimes if we can see tomorrow, five years may be hard to see. As mentors, we need to help frame that time. We need to explain that there might be a survival rate. What do you want to do in the future? Where are you aiming to go? Also, as mentors, we need to show them that it's okay to say things like, I don't know. Don't BS your way through a situation. Do not make up stories that you're just like, uh, 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 because that will reflect on you. Or somebody's going to say something like, Sarah, with React, 
how do you do integration testing? Well, personally, I'm not there yet. So I want to say, I don't know. Let me look that up. I am a search engine search away. Let me see what I can figure out. I don't know. And let me get back to you. I don't know should not be words that people are afraid to say. It's okay to say I don't know. And as mentors, we need to tell our mentees or our apprentices that it's okay to say I don't know. It's okay to not know. And then how do we take that I don't know? Well, doing a search in a search engine, be it Google or Bing, uh, DuckDuckGo. Maybe you're on a website like Stack Overflow and trying to find guidance. But teaching our apprentices and our mentees that I don't know is a thing, it's a good deal. As mentors, we want to teach them because if we just keep giving them answers, keep giving them hand, hands up to get them to grow in their, in their career, if we're just giving handouts, they'll take the handouts. But what happens when you're no longer there to give them a handout? You need to teach them how to do whatever it is they do rather than doing things for them. That way they can do this for their life. As mentors, it is crucial for us to give feedback, whether it's positive reinforcement of, hey, you're doing a great job. I see that you're really getting better with testing. Hey, I see you're getting really good about creating actionable items in our tracker program, something like that. If it's not good feedback, if it's bad news, give it as constructive criticism. But when you do that, make sure that it is actionable. As mentors, we need to listen. Put our listening ears on. Because when we listen to our, our mentees or our apprentices, or our protégés, whatever you want to call them, when we listen to them, we learn a lot about them. We may learn about what they're struggling with in the immediate. Maybe they're having trouble with understanding how the debugger works. Maybe they don't know about the dev tools in the browser and how awesome it is for debugging. Maybe they're having trouble with work-life balance. As I've mentioned, I'm a mom. I have two boys, they're six and eight, so they're little guys. Doing events like this, I love to do them, but I have to watch how often I do them because I need to maintain that work-life balance. I need to be able to have fun at conferences like this, but I also need to have time as mom and have time being the wife to an awesome guy who encourages me to do this community stuff. As a mentor, you need to be able to give guidance on how to survive conflict because conflict happens. For example, you're going to have a junior dev who's going to be like, yes, I get to use inline CSS. This is awesome. And the designer says, hmm. -mm. We're not doing inline CSS. It is not what you want. We're using CSS modules. But I only know inline CSS and this is what I'm going to do. <laughs> you need to learn CSS modules. That's just a thing. Maybe later in their career they run into, I want Git or I want Subversion. I want Mercurial. And so then we get into source control wars. Or, I want to use Visual Studio Code, I want to use Notepad++, and people have conflicts over that. Or, I'm going to take this approach and build in this pattern, and somebody's like, uh-uh, we're going to do this other pattern. Conflict happens in our field. As mentors, it's important that we teach them how to survive the conflict, how to approach it. And encourage juniors to speak up. I can't stress this enough. There have been times where I've been in meetings and a junior has had such a great idea, but they don't talk about it till after and they only talk to me about it. And I've been like, why do you only talk to me? Yes, I can elevate it after the fact, but if you're in a meeting and you're fitting right in that context, capture it now, speak up. Have somebody on the team who's there who can encourage them and elevate them. And with your mentors or mentees, Encourage documentation. Have them take notes of whatever they're, they're experiencing and learning so that they can go back and reflect on them later on. This is a tough one. As mentors, we need to challenge our mentees. We need to push them out of their comfort zone. So let me tell you a story about this one. This picture is me t 
I'm doing a talk about the history of women in tech on the center stage of the Peabody Opera House in St. Louis, Missouri. Now, let's explain some things here. I'm an introvert. I don't deal with people very well. Uh, at conferences, you'll see me talk. You'll see me take the stage. And then I disappear to wind down because it really drains me. Um, this was one of those where going to present has its challenges for an introvert. But I love sharing my knowledge. And so back in the late 90s, back in 99, when I was in college, I had a friend of mine who had said, Hey, Sarah, you know a thing or two about Samba's web administration tool. This is a Linux technology way back when. It's like, how about you co-present with me at the Linux user group? I'm an introvert. I don't like speaking in front of people. And this is a whole group of guys and they all look at me like I'm somebody's girlfriend, somebody's wife who doesn't know her stuff. She just happens to be there with the guys. Sometimes I like that cover because I can learn a lot more and they're unsuspecting. <sighs> fine, fine. Okay, fine. I'll co-present. So my friends saw the, that I had that energy to capture it. So late 99, I co-presented with him. I spoke at a conference in Denver with a team doing Java coding. And then I spoke back at the Linux users group again, which was a lot of fun, but this time I was doing it by myself. It's like riding a bike and you take the training wheels off. So yeah, I got this. Fast forward to 2008. I'm long graduated past college, moved back home to the Northeast Ohio area. And I was just like, all right, what are these user group things that my coworkers keep talking about? I should check one out. So I did. And my friend Jeff Blankenberg, you will hear me talk about Jeff Blankenberg on all of the social media because he's just that awesome. But he happened to be doing a talk at the Microsoft office about the cool things that were coming out that Microsoft was working on. And I was like, cool things Microsoft's working on. I've always been a Microsoft girl. I'm curious. Let's see what they're, we're doing. Well, Jeff has this energy to him that's really cool. Turns out, he's, he seems like he's a pretty cool guy. These are pretty neat things that they're working on. I think he mentioned some like World of Warcraft, and I was like, sweet! And then I realized, only girl in the room, and that sweet is going to stand out. Ah. But I ended up talking with him a bit more. He's like, hey, you should get into speaking. And I'm like, oh boy. I'm not going to talk about how I've spoken in the past. That's the history. So then he told me I should check out this event down in Central Ohio, Dave.net, go meet some other speakers, end up getting back into speaking. Here I am today, 12 years later, and still speaking at conferences and involved in the community. But being the introvert that I am, being the I don't deal with people well kind of person, speaking at conferences really pushes me out of my comfort zone. So when Strange told me I had a lunch session, I was like, sweet, lunch session, I'm going to be off to the side somewhere. People are going to be eating lunch, right? Mm -mm. Peabody Opera House. Opera House. In St. Louis, Missouri. And I'm center stage. Like, there's a section up there. Hi, guys, gals, people up there. I was terrified. I was totally out of my comfort zone. But I was sitting in the back of the theater that morning because I was not feeling well. My voice was threatening to go. So I was drinking hot tea sitting in the back of the, of the opera house. I remember this distinctly because there were girls who were supposed to go ahead of me to talk about Rails girls. And they were nowhere to be found. Now I'm already out of my comfort zone and panicking because center stage, it's not a side lunch topic. It's I'm on the center stage. Okay, fine. But the girls were nowhere to be found. Now, those of you who haven't dealt with us, when we're scared, we probably disappear to the restroom. Why? Because that's where we go to hide and install and cry. Just trust me on this. This is a logic thing. And so I went into the restroom. Sure enough, found them. 
So I had to do a talk just like a mentor would to a mentee. And I said, they're there to hear you. They're there to hear your content. Don't be afraid of them. And whatever you do, do not picture them naked. Whoever gave that kind of speaking advice was insane. Some things you can't unsee. Just don't go there. And they got some giggles. But it also helped them to rebuild that, that confidence and to get them on stage before I was. I was still out of my comfort zone, but having given them that talk brought me my nerves down a bit. As mentors, we need to challenge our mentees and to challenge the younger folks. Push them out of that comfort zone. See where they land. The comfort zone is there for a reason. It's like thinking inside the box and staying in the box. Think outside the box. As mentors, we need to encourage personal development as well. You want those you're mentoring to be the best that they can be. Not just the best dev, but the best human as well. And respect the career path that the folks you're mentoring are coming through. Nobody is on a straight path. I mean, this is the kind of path that I took, where I started in tech support once I graduated with my degree. I went from tech support to management, management back into desktop support in an IT team. Took on database administration, reporting, and web development there. Moved into web development full time, left that and went into consulting, and picked up speaking and organizing events along the way. And I have since bounced between management and development as well. But we all take different paths. Some people are just starting their paths. Some people, they take a more rocky path, a more sharp and, and crazier path. Some people feel like their careers are spiraling. I mean, this here, this is a, a shop from Monument in, in England, in London. But could you imagine somebody's career where it's actually spiraling? They start in one way and it just keeps going. You never know where this is going to go. Understand that not everybody takes one path in tech, and especially in technology. You have the IT admin side, you have the sysadmin, you have the hardware folks, the networking folks, you have security, you have the de web developers, you have desktop developers, mobile app developers, and that's just a little glimpse. Tech is wide. Understand that a career path, you may not be doing that same job for the lifetime of your career. You may be branching out. Now as mentors, we really need to help address the imposter syndrome. Don't encourage the voices in your head and the negativity. You need to get positivity in there. Now there's a, a mantra people use, which is fake it until you make it. And some folks are like, oh, I hate that phrase. But when you fight the voice inside, where it's telling you, I can't do this, I don't have it, I don't understand it, when in reality you do, that inner voice, that self-doubt can get really, really strong. It's, it's difficult. The more you do something, the more you realize that you've got it, and the more your confidence will come in in that imposter syndrome, it'll fade away. It'll go away. But it's common to see this at the beginning of something. Whether it's the beginning of a project, beginning of learning a new technology or a new tool, you're going to get those self-doubts coming through possibly. And that's okay. Understand that that voice is there. But understand that you can't let that voice rule you. Now as mentors, and especially if there's somebody who doesn't get this, because there are folks out there who don't get imposter syndrome. I'm envious of you, by the way, because here I am in the field 20 plus years later, and I still get this from time to time. It's not a consistent all the time, but I have my moments. So what triggers the imposter syndrome that we as mentors should be aware of? Well, new situations. Are you working at a new company, unfamiliar with new culture? unpopular situations. Uh, there was a time where we had some issues on our team and we had to make a very unpopular call, as in it was unpopular with some folks outside of our team. But we ended up working through that. 
we, we kept going, even though we were very uncertain. High stress situations are another thing. You can be so stressed out that you start doubting yourself. These are common things. This is normal. And if you don't get these, that may be your normal as well. But fake it until you make it. That's something that you almost, it's like one of those things. You just have to do it. You have to do it until you believe in yourself. Something else junior devs especially get into is analysis paralysis. I have a blank application. And especially in something like C Sharp or Java, some of these IDEs are, are a bit unwieldy. We have all sorts of windows. Now, as senior developers, we understand what these windows mean. But as a junior developer, oh my gosh, they're looking at the Solution Explorer. They're going, why are there so many folders? What do they all mean? And why are there all these windows? Oh my god, so many windows. Why? This looks like mass chaos just starting out. And white space is scary. And don't you show them a stack trace. Those are just as scary too because it's all this information in a small spot. Analysis paralysis and then overwhelming of data are both common things that you're going to see that juniors are going to go, help, what do I do? But they may not be so obvious. They may also be the ones who are sitting in their cubes crying, who are ripping out their hair, who are pacing back and forth, who are nervously wondering what to do. Understand that this is common for juniors to see all this and be feeling overwhelmed. Something else that they'll see is something where we have a lot of choices. How do you know what to choose? How do you know what's right for you? Juniors are going to see this and they're going to go, all of these choices and what is a class library versus an activity library versus, oh no, what is this Silverlight stuff? By the way, if you're using Silverlight, it's gone. It's okay to let it go. But juniors don't know that. We need to be able to show them that this isn't that scary. We can show them that they can use the search in the upper right corner to filter it down to maybe they want just a console application. Maybe they want to build just a class library. And you can have that conversation of what are those and how are they used. Something else juniors wonder about, again, making choices. Where do I start? For example, if you're doing Android development, are you developing for a tablet? Are you developing for a TV? Are you developing for wearable technology like smartwatches or like the, the lens things like the HoloLens? Are you developing for the Tesla uh, or some other kind of car? If so, I mean, this is, these are questions that juniors will have of how do I know what to choose? Because sometimes it's not really clear what tools that they should be using. So as mentors and mentees, we need to have those conversations and break that up. And then there's gender concerns. And I'm sighing because my background here shows males and females, but there are so many other genders out there nowadays. And it's not just males and females. You have the NB crew. You have the trans folks who may not identify with a single gender. They may be in one of the other genders that are out there. There are so many genders out there and there are various gender concerns. If as a mentor, you don't want to address the gender concerns, if that's not something you're comfortable talking about, let your mentee or your apprentice or your protege, let them know that. Because I know that this can be a very sensitive topic. But those concerns are there. And if you're not the right mentor for them, this goes back to having multiple mentors so that somebody can help them with those gender concerns. For me, I had concerns not about necessarily being a woman in tech. I'm used to working with a bunch of guys. I use, I'm used to being a trailblazer. I'm used to being the first woman on a team to kind of ease that tension and make them realize that women on the team we're not going to cause a big ruckus. We're actually capable of doing the tech things that we're getting hired to do. So I'm used to blazing those trails. 
But there are still things that I was concerned as a mom, for example, and being able to manage my time and have that work-life balance. And earlier on, how I was trying to manage work and life in that gray area where I need to be able to take a break from work, but I can't necessarily focus on life either because I was having to focus on my children as well and being a source for them. So being a mom and working and managing being a, a food source for a baby, for example, those were concerns that I had, but those were something that I couldn't ask guys of. I mean, I could, and they could tell me to talk to their wives, and I did for some cases, but them directly, not necessarily an easy conversation to have. Now, finding a mentor, how do you find somebody to mentor you? You're going to want to find a mentor in whatever the area is that you're working in. There's a quote from Condoleezza Rice. And basically, Condoleezza Rice, think about it, that she's a black female Soviet specialist. And if she was looking for a mentor who looked like her, good luck. She's a trailblazer. She, they were, she'd still be waiting. But most of her mentors were old white men because they were the ones who dominated in her field. Tech is very similar. It is still heavily male-dominated. And for many folks, they're like, oh, it's male-dominated, blah, blah, blah. But honestly, if I look back at my career, most, if not all, of my mentors have been men. Not old white men, depending on your definition of old. Um, but they've been folks who've been in the field for a long time. They're folks with the experience. And so for me, I find role models who are where I want to be. I find role models in people who are working with the technology that I want to work with and that I want to carry forward as well. So where can you find mentors? Well, I'm going to mention Cleveland Tech Slack. If you're in Northeast Ohio, we actually have a channel called Mentoring where you can find mentors. Some companies have a mentoring program, so it might be helpful to find mentors through that program. Now I have to preface it with the fact that some companies have a mentoring program that works really well and people find each other, and then sometimes it's forced. A forced mentoring relationship is tough to deal with, especially if you have two personalities that don't get along well together. But if you find somebody in your company who's doing things that you want to learn more about, you might be able to find a mentor by just reaching out to them. Maybe your boss is someone that you would consider a mentor. Maybe another experienced colleague on a project. Again, like I said, maybe they have a formal mentoring program, but be careful with how they handle that. Because if it's forced and you don't get along, it's not going to go well. Maybe you'll find mentors outside of a company, such as going to community engagements, be it meetup.com or nowadays through various virtual sessions. I know folks are doing virtual coffees, virtual teas. Um, that's a great way to meet each other and to network. You can go to conferences like this one and see who's speaking. You would be surprised how many speakers are actually up for mentoring. Again, user groups or meetups. There's a website called MentorNet that actually specializes in mentoring. Mentoring.org is another one as well. And if you can, look for them locally in things like Slack or Discord, for example, Twitter, things like that. Uh, Cleveland Tech Slack, like I said, clevelandtech.slack.com, they're a great crew here in Northeast Ohio. And the mentoring channel is a good way to find mentors. Um, you can also find all sorts of activity in the community as well. Some additional mentoring programs to know about. Um, iSisters, Women in Technology, IEEE, MicroMentor. Uh, some of the ACM chapters also have mentoring programs. All of these links in these slides will be made available after the conference as well, so that you will have these links available. Now, I went to Microsoft for the Microsoft MVP Summit, and in 2015, it was in November, 
And so I was at the Microsoft Visitor Center on campus in Redmond, Washington, uh, fulfilling childhood dreams of actually going up to Microsoft, which was so cool. But I saw this mission statement and it made me think of what our goal as a mentor is. So our mission, the Microsoft mission, is to empower every person in every organization on the planet to achieve more. Our role as mentors is to empower those who we are mentoring to achieve more, to be the best that they can. One more word of advice if you're going to mentor is encourage your mentees, your apprentices, your protégés, whatever you want to call them, encourage them to continue to grow, to stay curious, and to explore. This is a quote that I first saw it was about 2012, I believe. Actually, no, I take that back. It was before that because in 2012 I was consulting. This is when our DBA left when I was at the manufacturing firm. So we're talking about 2004 to 2007. Um, our DBA found another opportunity and she left this quote on her desk. I remember the post-it. And it said, 20 years from now, you will be more disappointed by the things you didn't do than by the ones you did do. So throw off the bow lines, sail away from the safe harbor, catch the trade winds in your sails, explore, dream, and discover. As mentors, I encourage your, those who are, you're serving to explore, dream, and discover as well. Wishing you lots of success ahead as mentors and wishing our juniors a lot of success as well. Thank you.